A reading from the Old Testament, the book of Samuel, chapter 5. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, Look, we are your bone and flesh. For some time, while Saul was king over us, it was you who led out Israel and brought it in. The Lord said to you, it is you who shall be shepherd of my people Israel, you who shall be ruler over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned for 40 years. At Hebron, he reigned over Judah for seven years and six months. And at Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel and Judea for 33 years. David occupied the stronghold and named it the city of David. David built the city all around from the Milo inwards and David became greater and greater for the Lord, the God of hosts was with him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia, the word of the Lord endures forever. The word of the Lord is the good news announced to you. Alleluia. The Lord be with you. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Jesus came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter? the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, prophets are not without honor except in their own town and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about among the villagers teaching. 
He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. This is the gospel of the Lord. I speak in the name of the living God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Earlier this week, I had a conversation with somebody about the readings that are chosen, that we hear read every Sunday. And indeed, every day for those who come to church, more often than once a week. I was extolling the virtue of what's known as the revised common lectionary. I won't ask you to put your hands up if you've ever heard of that. But the revised common lectionary is the arrangement of readings that is set for each day of the year. And is, in theory, used by every Church of England church, every Episcopal church, every Roman Catholic church, every Methodist church, and many other churches across the world as well. In this conversation, I was saying how powerful it is that we all share the same readings every day, and that even if our preachers choose to talk about something different, we are united as the Church of God, and we walk the same path together. And then, having said all this, I sat down to write a sermon to preach this morning, and I wished I had never said what I said, and that I had a bit more freedom to choose the readings that I wanted to preach on for myself. Yesterday morning, I woke, knowing that it was the day when new deacons were to be ordained into ministry in our diocese. Perhaps not surprisingly, Claire was in my thoughts and my prayers. I've known Claire, as you know, for quite a few years now. She made my family very welcome when we arrived in Wakefield. And even though it was during lockdown, you all made her very welcome when she came here on placement. And yesterday, I was privileged enough, despite the restrictions and the limits on numbers, to be able to be in Ripon Cathedral and to share in her joy as she was ordained a deacon in the church. But going back to where I left off, when I woke up yesterday morning, I had a passage from the prophecy of Isaiah firmly stuck in my head. And as I considered my sermon for this morning, if I'm completely honest, I would have much rather that passage from Isaiah had been our Old Testament reading this morning. But it wasn't, and I had to live with that. And so I began my day. I logged on to morning prayer, and a few of us prayed together on the feast day of St. Thomas the Apostle. And believe it or not, halfway through morning prayer yesterday, these words from the prophecy of Isaiah that were already in my head suddenly appeared in the liturgy of morning prayer. And so even though we couldn't hear them this morning, They were said together by a small group of us saying morning prayer yesterday. And at the time of writing this sermon, before setting off for Ripon yesterday, I, who am really not a gambling man, I can assure you, would have been willing to put a fair amount of money on the fact that I would hear these words again by the end of the day. That is quite a build-up, isn't it, for a section of the prophecy of Isaiah? And I'm sure by now you'd probably quite like to know which part of the prophecy I'm talking about. 
perhaps not surprisingly, it's those verses that were sung at my ordination to the diaconate and were sung again at my ordination to the priesthood, to that beautiful setting by Edward Elgar. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour, to comfort all who mourn. These words were spoken by Isaiah, not about himself, but in prophecy of what is to come. They are the words that describe the one who would come, and they sit among many other of Isaiah's prophecies. Prophecies about a messenger preparing the way for the Messiah. Prophecies about the Messiah being born of a virgin. Prophecies about the Messiah coming out of Nazareth. Prophecies about the Messiah speaking in parables. Prophecies about the Messiah being rejected by his own people. And so many others as well. And when we look at these prophecies together, we see a very clear picture, which is replicated in the Gospels. As one by one, Isaiah's prophecies are brought to life and fulfillment by Jesus. But it is just possible that these words I had so firmly stuck in my head yesterday morning are the most powerful, the most amazing of all the words that Isaiah spoke. And I say that on the basis that they are the words that Jesus used to make such a big impact when he spoke in the synagogue. If you remember, he read those very words from the scroll. He rolled up the scroll and he said, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The time was right then for everyone to know that Jesus was the Messiah, that he was the one who the Spirit of the Lord was upon, that he was the one sent to bring the good news, to bind up the brokenhearted, to free those who are held captive, to comfort all who mourn, and to speak of the glory of God. These are the words that I felt I couldn't escape yesterday, whether inside my own head or used at morning prayer, or my expectation that they would be sung in Ripon Cathedral at Clare's ordination. Of course, the choir in Ripon Cathedral at the moment is under the same distancing regulations as everywhere else and wasn't big enough, and they didn't sing it which was a great disappointment, but maybe very glad I hadn't put any money on the fact I would hear it again. But they are words amongst the most powerful descriptions of who Jesus is, of what Jesus does, and our, of our relationship with him. And we might struggle to find a more powerful description anywhere else in the Bible. But to go back to where I began, they're not in the lectionary for today. They're not the words we should be hearing today. And so I probably should say something before I finish about at least one of this morning's readings. In our gospel reading this morning, we have the opportunity to contrast these words of Isaiah with the reality of Jesus' situation. He's been teaching in the synagogue in his own hometown, the place where he grew up, among the people he grew up with. Unlike the other time we have just related when we heard him preaching in the synagogue, this time we don't know what the text was that he was preaching on. We don't know what he said as he taught. But we do get to hear the issue that he comes up against. He's talking to people who have known him as a young boy, talking to people who have watched him grow up, talking to people who have bought their furniture from Joseph's carpentry business, talking to people who have sat with Mary, talking to friends. He's around people who have shared in his whole life 
and who know that even had such places existed at the time, Jesus hadn't been to Oxford or Cambridge to complete his education, or even to the University of Jerusalem, which I found out courtesy of Google only yesterday, houses the largest Jewish studies library in the world. These people knew that Jesus hadn't had these opportunities. And yet he was speaking with such authority, such clarity, and such knowledge. And so perhaps it's no surprise that this is one of his toughest audiences. The question, where did this man get all this knowledge? is based on a very real knowledge of this man and that he's not had the sort of upbringing that enables him to speak with this authority. It's important for us to hear this, but perhaps even more important for us to hear what comes next. We hear that Jesus couldn't do any real acts of power. He couldn't perform any significant miracles in this place. He healed a few sick people, but no more than this. If you remember, we heard last week the story of the woman who had been bleeding for 12 years. And we heard how great was her faith, that she believed that all she had to do was touch Jesus' clothes and she would be healed. Such faith. And she wasn't disappointed. And yet today we hear about people without that faith. And Jesus couldn't perform any miracles. What is there for us to see and hear in this truth is that it is our faith that makes the difference. Jesus is there for all of us. For all of us gathered here, for all of our communities who we live among, for all of our friends and our families. And so it can be painful when we hear the question, why isn't God with me? Why doesn't God stop this happening? Indeed, in the last 16 months, I've heard that question more than I've heard it ever before. What we heard in our reading last week is that Jesus is ready to walk alongside, to travel with, to guide and to support all who come to him. But what we hear from our reading this week is that it is our faith that enables Jesus to come close. If we have no faith, Jesus can work no acts of power. If we don't believe in Jesus, we simply won't know and see his love because we have to come to him first. That, of course, does cause a real problem. It's a bit like the old question of which came first, the chicken or the egg? How can either be without the other one being there first? How on earth can people come to believe in a God who they cannot see if they have no faith in him before he can respond to them? I believe that brings us back to those words stuck in my head yesterday morning from the prophecy of Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. He sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour, to comfort all who mourn. This is what Jesus brings to all who come to him. But people have to know how to come to him, and so there has to be more. While in our gospel reading this morning, we heard Jesus send his disciples out with authority over unclean spirits, to accept hospitality, to extend the work that he himself had begun, to speak to all who had ears to hear and to be utterly convincing about Jesus, anointed by the Spirit of the Lord and offering all these things prophesied to by Isaiah to all who believe in him. 
And this is the same story that we are still part of today. It may be a different world with more educated people who can explain far more about science and the earth in which we live. But it's also still the same world, the same world in which Jesus longs to walk beside all who come to him. And we, gathered here this morning, are the disciples of this day, those who are sent out to extend his work, to accept and show hospitality to be utterly convincing and to bring people to hear and to know Jesus as our Lord and Saviour. And so let us pray today for our place as the church in the world. Let us pray for all who were ordained yesterday and anointed to serve God. Let us pray for all who read the same readings this morning and reflect on the nature of our relationship with God. And let us pray today for our community as we go out among them to be convincing disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>